Okay. Well, uh, let's get started. Uh, welcome everybody to the economics of soil health. We have a couple of really good speakers today that are going to be, <coughs> excuse me, focusing their presentations on uh, the economic uh, upsides and perhaps uh, some downsides of uh, investing in your soils and soil health. Uh, I'd ask if you have questions uh, to put them in the Q&A, not the chat, but the Q&A in, in the Whova uh, platform. And uh, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce uh, both our speakers today. Our first speaker today is uh, Adam Chappelle. Adam farms 8,000 acres in Northeast Arkansas. He grows corn, cotton, rice, soybeans, and a mix of small grains. Uh, along with his brother, Seth, the Chappelles have re-envisioned agricultural management in their part of the world, jumping into the world of soil health to fend off herbicide-resistant weeds and precariously thin profit margins. Adam was recently featured in a Farm Journal article where he was quoted as saying, call it soil health, conservation, sustainable, regenerative, or any other buzzword of the day. Frankly, I don't care. My savings have been incredible, and I just call my farming what it is, survival and profitability. He planted his first cover crop in 2010 to better manage uh, pigweed, which was essentially putting him out of business, and has been experimenting with and learning about managing cover crops ever since. Adam has a bachelor's in botany from ASU and a master's in science and entomology from U of A, um, go Razorbacks, I guess. And our second speaker today, uh, Harry Green. And Harry is an agroforestry ec economist and farmer and an athlete. He works to grow human capacity and raise our standards for what life on earth can be. Why trees? He's gonna be focusing on agroforestry. Uh, years spent trail running, open water swimming, and whitewater kayaking made the correlation between intact forests, air quality, and water quality apparent and intuitive. The lungs of the planet were breathing life into the lungs of humanity. Why agroforestry? Because the agricultural landscapes that yield the calories we eat can also be complex, diverse, and life-creating beyond just yielding fat, carbs, and protein. Propagate Ventures, a company he works with, makes it easy for land managers to integrate profitable tree crops into working farms by bridging the capital and operational gaps needed to plant and manage productive agroforestry systems. Harry and Propagate operate on the thesis that better information begets great land management. Before graduate school, Harry spent two years as a resident athlete at the Colorado Springs Olympic Training Center competing in the world of uh, modern pentathlon. Once an Olympic hopeful, he competed on the World Cup circuit in countries such as Mexico and Egypt, and at the uh, 2015 World Cup championships in Berlin. So uh, first off, um, e excellent speakers today. And uh, Adam, I'm going to turn the program over to you. All right, let me get my screen sharing here. Right. Well, <clears throat> we're talking about the economics of soil health today. So I'm going to kind of touch on uh, kind of the state of production agriculture as it is right now and how we've shifted our focus to looking at, you know, profitability instead of pushing yields. And, you know, looking at profitability may sound intuitive to uh, some of you in the audience or maybe all of you, but, you know, unfortunately that's not um, what farmers are pushed towards or uh, look at for the most part. It's primarily about pushing yields and you can really get into some financial issues doing that. So um, <clears throat> all right. So, you know, focusing on profit, profit instead of yield by leveraging regenerative practices. That's what we've done. Uh, you know, we've changed the entire way we farm to fit a 
what's being described as a regenerative model. It's uh, just a common sense model if you look at it, in my opinion. But, um, you know, currently in, in big in production agriculture, you know, big ag companies are making all the profits and farmers are barely hanging on. And, you know, we're in an environment right now where we have extremely high commodity prices, but the input prices have increased to a point where, you know, there's very little profit left uh, at the end of the growing season. So, you know, developing systems that focus on soil health and reducing inputs are, are never going to be a hot topic in the big ag world. They're never going to push a system that's, you know, going to be good for farmers and bad for them. So uh, as farmers, we need to really start looking to these regenerative practices to, to make a living. Um, so who am I to tell anybody how to do anything? Well, I don't tell folks how to do much. If they ask, I'll let them know what I'm doing, but, uh, a little bit of credentials there, like Rex mentioned, I've got a degree in botany and a advanced degree in entomology. And then, you know, I've been farming for a long time. Uh, my brother and I have been on this same land for four generations and we're, we're down now, Rex, to 7,500 acres. Our, our downsizing continues, um. Uh, and we have plans to do more, uh, which is completely opposite to the trend around us. Uh, everybody else is looking for more acres uh, because the margins are so thin. They're trying to, that's the way they see to make a living. But we're able to do that because we're making the same crops with a lot less money with these practices. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So regenerative practices for us have been able to save in three major categories. And these are, you know, some this is the three biggest categories I mean, we could talk about irrigation we could talk about equipment labor any number of things that we've saved on but these three here in the time i have today are the ones that i think are the most impactful especially with the input prices we're seeing uh right now so these are the three we're going to kind of touch on so the first thing is seeding rates um since our soils have become alive and and we've got them covered all the time. Weeds aren't as much of a problem. We can reduce seeding rates significantly. And the cost of seed uh, is just, well, ridiculous for lack of a better term. But just for context, you know, a uh, bag of cotton seed in my area for a GMO bag is about $585 to $650 a bag. And uh, under traditional, um, planting rates you can get about five acres a bag out of that so you know that's pretty substantial rice uh it's in that it's in the area for conventional seeding rates you know you're looking for hybrid about 170 dollars an acre corn you know 130 to 50 dollars an acre i mean seed is a huge expense but if you can push these rates down in a healthy system you, you're looking at the ability to save a tremendous amount of money without reducing yields, but you're reducing your risk through inputs. And, you know, you can get fewer, fewer inputs. The plants just produce more. So you're looking at more reproductive capacity per plant versus per acre. And you do that through more light interception, bigger roots, and uh, other things we're going to talk about. But two systems we've been looking at uh, is rice intensification. Now, this is an old system. They do it in a lot of third world countries, and they do it because it's efficient. They make excellent crops and they don't have to rely on inputs. You know, you're talking about uh, through this system here in, uh, in Madagascar, they're planting uh, one plant per square foot. So that's a 90% reduction in seed compared to their traditional methods. Um, you know, and then with their, with this lower population, the demand for water and nutrients on a per acre basis goes down because each plant is so much more efficient. So they've been able to reduce irrigation uh, or water demand by 50%. Most of their fertility or all their fertility is compost. So they're not relying on synthetic uh, fertility here. They just get so much more efficiency by having a, a, a lower seeding rate and a healthier system that they're making better rice on a per yield basis or per acre basis than we are here in America with all of our technology and, you know, fertilizers and herbicides. And I mean, they're doing better on a per acre basis than we are. So why hadn't we heard of this system 
especially in Arkansas, the largest rice growing state in the union. Um, I can think of a couple of reasons and they all have to do with not selling as many inputs. So, um, but we need to be looking at these systems with the technology and things that we have, we should be able to push this system to the next level and make it, you know, productive across all, all rice acres and, and really have a profitable system and a sustainable system by using less, you know, synthetic herbicides, water, especially with rice. You know, if you can cut water by 50%, that's a huge uh, reduction in the draw in our aquifers. So lots of things we can do here. Um, and we've been doing this on our farm. So we've tried to develop this system with modern planting technology. Um, you know, ideally we're looking for one seed per square foot, uh, but we don't have the ability to do that currently. So we're on a, a, a road system. So we have a 15 by 23 inch spacing. It's not a 12 by 12, um, but we've been able to reduce the uh, seeding rate from what's recommended by 75%. So we're closing in on that 90% reduction in seeding. And, and that equates to me to about $130 an acre just in seed cost. So, you know, we can do this because we have a biologically active system. And, you know, these plants just tiller so prolifically in this healthy system that we're able to make this work. So, uh, but this is some pictures from this year, you know, what the rice looked like through the season. And we had one of the best rice crops we've ever cut. So I'm excited about this upcoming year. And it was by far the most profitable because our inputs were just ridiculously low compared to what they normally are. Um, we're also doing this in cotton. Uh, this is another huge savings. I mean, cotton seed is just crazy high. And with these wider rows and lower planting populations, we get all the same benefits we're seeing in the rice. You know, more efficient nutrient utilization a lot less uh need for irrigation water i mean these root systems on these plants are so huge that you know we're just barely irrigating at all even in our hottest driest months uh, so this is just a much more sustainable system and a lot more economic system um and in these pictures you notice in the in the middles there those cover crop residues are there that's a key component to these lower uh seeding rates you know you've got to be able to maintain your weed control by spacing things out because you're you're you know providing an opportunity for weeds to come through but if you've got that mat there you know weed control still pretty easy but we can make really good cotton with a lot less money uh just by leveraging bigger root systems and you know uh better plant efficiency so i mentioned it briefly but this is our effect on our bottom line you know this is our hybrid rice recommended rates versus what we planted uh same with cotton <clears throat> so about a 60 dollar an acre savings on cotton and like i said 130 dollar an acre savings on rice so you know really the main thing here is time and space you've got to get the stuff planted a little bit earlier to have time for all the secondary and tertiary fruiting positions and all these plants and tillers and the rice. But if you can do that, then this system works really well. Uh, it's been working well for us for three years now. <clears throat> the next thing, and this ought to be a huge topic for any farmers that are listening right now is fertility. Uh, fertility inputs right now are as high as I've ever seen them. Um, it is, really out of control the amount of profiteering that's going on uh every time we get a headline prices go up and you know that just doesn't make sense to me but it is what it is so we've got to deal with it but i'm going to pick on my local university a little bit just because that's who we use but so everybody gets their fertility recommendations around here from soil testing you know they either use our university system or they use a a third party lab, but a few things that I've in our system that aren't working for us anymore um, are the test itself. Um, and then how we pull the test is the main thing. So the, the blue arrow there is pointing to a, a 
line in that in on that screen and I, and I made these slides pretty busy for zoom because i think y'all can go back and watch them again later and kind of zoom in and look at these so i tried to provide some more information but basically that takeaway there is these are calibrated and recommended on a six inch sampling depth so if your rooting zone is only six inches deep then this may work this may be fine for you i don't know but if your rooting zone is only six inches deep then you have bigger problems than fertility uh you know you're you're in trouble from the get-go so so what i do to combat this because you know everybody that sees one of those samples saw the recommendation at the bottom that i need to put out fertilizer but i've got roots uh regularly reaching between you know 36 and 48 inches of depth so you know i just started pulling some samples at depth and seeing what was available in those areas um you know to to basically argue against people telling me I need to apply fertilizer. So two things about this that I want you to notice. So the first, these, these are three samples, one at zero to six, and then back in the same holes at six to 12, and then again at 12 to 18. So that's three sections there. And again, I've, I've got roots from 36 to 48 inches because of our soil structure and the, you know, crop roots following cover crop root channels and things. So this is just a small fraction of what we have available. But if you add up all the available nutrients in those, just those three samples, I've got more than enough to produce a crop. I don't need to add any synthetic fertilizer at all. So, you know, my advice to a farmer, if you want to save money, instead of adding more fertilizer, get bigger roots, uh, improve your soil structure and get bigger roots that, that will increase your access to nutrients and water exponentially way more than you could ever apply just with a spreader buggy and some fertilizer. So, you know, let's focus on soil health and soil structure rather than adding more stuff. Um, another thing I wanted you to notice is this, these soil samples were divided and sent to the U of A and then again to this ward lab or I mean a uh, waters lab and the results, this is the same test. The results are completely different. So, that's another problem I have with soil testing. I mean, I can't get any more consistent than pulling out of the same hole, splitting the bucket up and sending it two different places and getting completely different results. That's another problem I see with this, but that's a topic for a different day. I've only got 30 minutes here. <laughs> so, but so the last thing we've been looking at is uh, total nutrients at depth. So instead of looking at just Malik three, um, you know, which in my system is a flawed test. It may be fine for a conventionally tilled guy, but in my system, it does not correlate to what I'm seeing. So we started pulling total nutrient extractions, which is just a total nutrient digestion, similar to a mining assay. Like if you wanted to go mine potassium in your soil, this would be what you do to see how much is out there. So what we have here is five samples, all at six inch increments. So the, the higher sample number, the deeper you go. Okay. So, just in the top six inches is what we have categorized at the bottom of the page here. Let me get my pointer out. So this is just the top six inches. And this is the total nutrients that I have. I have this many years worth of nutrients to pull off, uh, you know, really good uh, 230 bushel corn crop, 75 bushel beans, and three bale cotton, which are higher than I normally make. So I've got this many years of total nutrients available there you know, accessible to my plants just in the top six inches. And we went down 30 inches here and you can see those numbers don't slack off in those 30 inches. So there are vast amounts of nutrients in these soils that we have to figure out how to tap into. And you do that with roots and biology. And the only way to do that is to move your system towards a regenerative system. But think of the money you could be saving this year with the cost of you know, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, all these things that you're having to buy because your soils are dead, what you could be putting in your pocket instead. I mean, I didn't do the math on it because I didn't want to feel sick to my stomach today, but it's substantial. So roots, more roots equal more access to nutrients and water and also more opportunity for beneficial microbial colonization and mycorrhizal fungi associations. I mean, those things in themselves 
can provide so much fertility to your plants just the just the life and death cycle of you know bacteria protozoa actinomycetes all these things and then fungal associations everybody in production ag thinks fungus is bad well there's only a few bad actors most of them are good or benign so you know we've got to get over that but but that's again that's another thing pushed on us by you know ag ag supply companies i mean they want you to spray something to kill everything because they that's how they make money but you know that's not the way you need to look at it you need to look at keeping stuff going and alive and we'll talk about that in pest management but um you know these roots on this page you know that cotton plant had just emerged just put its head out and it had a you know three four inch tap root there that's that's pretty significant in my part of the world um you know the next uh, picture under that is some uh, uh that was cereal rye roots you know at 48 inches just roots everywhere and then the big picture there is a soybean root now in arkansas in a conventionally tilled system a soybean root looks pretty pitiful it is about i don't know three inches that goes down and then it j hooks off to the right or left and it looks sick all the time and they look pretty pretty pathetic and we always have tap root decline we have you know pythium root rot we have all kinds of diseases in our soybeans but the soybean roots that you're seeing there some off our farm that hadn't had any fungicide applied to the seed there's you know this is just the result of not disturbing the soil and not killing everything constantly you know good rotations cover crops keeping something living all the time i mean those roots are packed with rhizobia they're packed with all other kinds of associations and the fine root hairs on those things are just ridiculous i mean i i'm really impressed with those soybean roots i like digging them up every year because i just love seeing that because i didn't used to see that but all of those roots add up to less fertility and less irrigation i mean that's just what it, you know we're talking economics that's what you're looking at so healthy rhizosphere, a lot of y'all probably know all this stuff, but when I give talks to farmers, they, they, you know, they've not heard of a rhizosphere and what, why is it important? Well, it's important because of all the things good it does, you know, and it's basically an extension of your root system and it's a, a way to mineralize and, and free up, uh, all kinds of nutrients that are critical for the, for the growth and development of your crop. So fostering that can have huge effects on your bottom line by, you know, not having a reliance on synthetic inputs, but, um, you know, we try to not disturb and keep, keep this system proliferating year round. So we're providing a living root year round with cover crops or a crop, and we're trying never to disturb the soil if we can. And the things we've seen in the last 10 years on our farm are just ridiculous as far as, you know, life in the soil but this is kind of what things look like when you transition from you know conventional till to to where we are now so you know the the picture with the cage there is hydroponic wheat you know that was my best example of a plant with zero rhizosphere you know everything that that plant's ever going to have is going to be provided through that liquid solution so there's no exchange between you know, the soil complex and the plant by any microbial activity. I mean, so you're basically spoon feeding that thing, everything it's going to ever have. And that's a lot like our conventional ag system. You know, it's expensive because you have to provide everything. But as you start transitioning to these practices, you start getting a developing rhizosphere. So if I get my pointer back out here, <clears throat> you know, you can see a nice rhizosphere starting to cling to these roots. You know, this is two or three years in on my farm, some fields that we're uh, moving towards, you know, it's just basically some late additions, but uh, you can see that starting to develop. And then over here, you've got some that have been long-term. I mean, look at the, look at the dirt clinging to those roots. That's all microbial activity making that happen. I mean, that's what you want to see. This weed over here is not going to require near 
the the inputs that this weed is going to require. So, you know, that's that's money in your pocket. And and microbes and stuff work for free. You know, I don't have any labor that works for free other than what's in my soil. So uh, those are the kind of things you want want to work with. So another thing we've been seeing and, and things that provide huge benefits to your bottom line that nobody thinks about. I never thought about it, but just macro life in the soil, like earthworms. I never thought of earthworms as anything more than fishing bait before I started down this road. And when I started figuring out what those things were capable of and what they're doing for you, I want as many as I can get. So you can read in there. If you have 25 worms per cubic foot, uh, that's about a million earthworms per acre. Uh, they can digest 36 tons of soil in a year. All right. Well, the castings from those worms generally have a uh, nutrient uh, analysis of 430.73, you know, per ton. So four pounds of nitrogen, 30 phosphorus, 73 potassium per ton of castings well if you get 36 tons of soil digested you know and then you you've got that much castings behind them that is a lot of available nutrients that you're not going to get if those guys aren't out there working for you and you're not going to have them if you're bombarding the soil with chemicals fertilizers and tillage equipment so we have to mitigate the things that we use uh, to foster this but not just in, in nutrient contribution, I had no idea on this, but we have been seeing our water infiltration rates go up substantially. And I think this is a lot of it. The effects from burrowing from that many worms can increase your infiltration rate 60 fold. Now that is huge. So if you get a five inch rain, like we do constantly around here in the South, that's the difference between putting it in the ground or putting it in the ditch. And, you know, Every time water goes in the ditch, if you've got exposed soil, it's taking all your good topsoil with it. So that's another economic loss. So these things just keep piling up. All right, pest management. This is this is a no brainer to me. But um, you know what a pest need? They got to have a host or food. They got to have water and they got to have habitat. So how do we break those things up? How do we break overwintering habitats? Or you know how do we uh take away sunlight in, like for weeds um you know we're going to talk about that and then you know when you provide a, a good habitat for for insects you've got a predator prey cycle that looks something like this which is how you want it to look so weeds you know weeds need several things to be successful they, they need sunlight they need stable temperatures and they need nitrates and water you know, to really get going. Pigweed especially has to have all three of those things. So pigweed is my example here. What do we do to deprive them of sunlight, disrupt fluctuations of temperature, reduce nitrates, and uh, excess water in the soil? Plant cover crops. Cover crops, uh, they accomplish all three of those things. That's the easiest way to control pigweeds in Arkansas is to shade them out with a living plant. They just cannot handle that. You know, everybody wants to just spray something because it's easier than trying to manage a cover crop, but it's so much more expensive and you're just accelerating the curve towards resistant pigweeds. I mean, we're already got resistant pigweed to, you know, we had glyphosate. Now we've got glufosinate, 2,4-D and dicamba. And those are the three biggest sprayed uh, herbicides out in Arkansas right now. And we're losing those fast. So you know, reduce tillage and plant a cover crop and you've got them whooped. Uh, so tillage, you know, if y'all can see this, all these little green dots, that's pigweeds. And this is just a year or so ago. You know, if I still till today in cotton plant, I get a flush of pigweeds, huge, like a carpet. But right next to that pass, if I leave my residue intact and just plant a cover crop into that after the fall, after the harvest, I don't get any weeds coming up. So that's pretty simple. Not only can I cut out a, a tillage pass and save money, but I don't have weeds. So I don't know why anybody would do it any other way. I know I'm not going to, but 
<clears throat> armor in the soil. You know, we've got a cover crop planted. We lay it down flat and we plant into it. That's just, uh, that's just pretty easy. Um, you know, that's, that's what our fields look like in the spring. And we run the planter right in there behind those and pigweeds are not coming through that. But on top of that, we've provided habitat for birds, you know, other insects. We're, we're cycling nutrients. Earthworms have stuff to eat. Microbial populations are happy because they're getting tons of root exudates. We're setting up a system that is going to be successful with very little input. And that's the key to making money these days. So, um, well there we go but that thick layer of cover crop through the through the summer is the is the key to you know keeping those weeds down and and minimizing your uh your uh dependence on irrigation so if you can mulch that soil and keep evaporation losses down and shade those weeds your herbicide use is just going to go down uh significantly so you know it's just an easy way to save money. So this is kind of just what it did for the bottom line on this wide row cotton last year. You know, this was our herbicide regime uh, to keep that cotton clean. That's pretty cheap compared to where I was at $100 an acre, you know, prior to this, prior to this uh, regenerative transition. So, and we're doing better than that. Uh, well, we plan to do better than that year, this year. We've got some different equipment that's going to let us post direct some applications of stuff and should uh, should cut this down even further. And and we need to this year because the price of everything is up. So, um, you know, big effect on your bottom line. Okay, and pathogens. You know, this is the one everybody around here is worried about. Everybody wants to treat their seed with all kinds of stuff to keep these kinds of things from attacking your plants. But these things are opportunistic. If you can outcompete them with a different fungus or a different bacteria, then they're non-existent. We don't see these kind of diseases much on our farm. If we do, it's in a, a really wet area where we, you know, have poor microbial life uh, because it's just waterlogged and anaerobic all the time. But these things are rampant even with all the seed treatments. So farmers are spending tons of money on seed treatments and still getting these diseases. That that's uh shouldn't be happening but that's what's happening so why not take a different approach uh foster life that will outcompete these diseases uh that's been working great for us and it's really simple to do you just do the thing that you do for everything else and it just happens it's not like you have to do a special thing to get this happening so just encourage life in the soil and don't disturb habitat and Limit the use of chemicals that kill fungus and bacteria. You know, there's all kinds of things that eat those diseases and nematodes. Like nematodes are a huge issue in Arkansas. That's a prime example. But everybody wants to use like telome or something to fumigate soil and just sterilize it. You are just resetting the clock to go right back to the problem. And you're spending a huge amount of money when you could foster, you know, predatory nematodes. There's actually a fungus that catches parasitic nematodes in a noose structure. Now that's amazing to me. You know, there's all kinds of things that eat nematodes. Um, you know, different insects eat nematodes, tardigrades eat nematodes. I mean, just stop, you know, nuking everything and these problems will alleviate themselves. So, um, like I said, y'all need to go back and read these slides cause I made them pretty busy, but insects this is my favorite part um the uh uh you know with these all, all these cover crops and the flowering insects and things or flowering plants we're providing habitat for predatory insects long before the crop is ever around so you know we have huge numbers of predatory insects and pollinator insects before pests even think about hitting the system so they just don't have a chance to get started. Um, the other thing we're doing with the cover crops and reducing our synthetic in is we're reducing our levels of nitrates in plants. Excess nitrates 
attract insects. That is well documented. So if you can reduce those, you're going to reduce the, the, the attraction to pest insects. And healthy plants just don't succumb to insect attack uh, as easy as unhealthy plants. So, you know, you can, you can break these cycles just by improving your health, your, the health of your soil. So uh, we, often, we obviously use insecticides if we have to, but we try to stay very selective with our modes of action and we try to only use them when absolutely necessary. So we don't want to break up the life cycles of any predatory insects. So that's reduced our uh, use of pesticides quite a bit. Uh, we'll look at that in a minute, but you know, <clears throat> insects will self-regulate themselves. I mean, if you if you get a pest buildup, you're going to get a predatory buildup. That's just how it works. It's always worked that way, and it will continue to work that way if we don't, you know, nuke everything before it has a chance to happen. So. Um, but on our insect control, this is state average versus where we are. Uh, you know, we're looking at several dollars per acre in savings, but not only that, but the, the, the chemical load on the environment. I mean, we're looking at, you know, a spray to two sprays on a field with one selective insecticide versus, you know, all of these to control pests because our predatory populations are such that we don't have to rely on insecticides near to the extent that our uh, neighbors in the state do. So, you know, economically and environmentally, we're having a big impact there. But <clears throat> I kind of rolled through that pretty quick, but you know, the, the take home message that I always try to give to farmers and whoever that's listening is just because it's always been done that way. doesn't mean that's how you got to do it. Uh, you know, you got to forget everything that you know, everything that you've been taught because most of it's been taught to you by somebody who was influenced by uh some big company selling something you know and we've got to be aware of that so i tell you to clear your mind and open your eyes and learn something so with that i'll take some questions rex or, or are we doing that at the end whatever whatever you got going yeah Adam, thank you for a very inspiring presentation. Um, I think we, we have uh, time to take up, uh, you know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes worth of questions. Omar, um, maybe cut off the questions uh, at 10.55, All right. uh, our time, um, or a little bit earlier uh, if, if there's uh, no more questions. But thank you, Adam, that um, it is inspiring to hear what you're doing it's great take it over omar sounds good i'll jump right into it looks like our first question is about cover crop takedown methods it looks like you showed a roller crimper but maybe you can add a little context to that yeah that was just a uh, flat roller um, ah. yeah so we uh still depend on herbicides to terminate our cover crops um and the reason for that is generally we're planting early enough in the South that our cover crops haven't reached a very susceptible uh, stage to crimping. Uh, you know, the later planted stuff definitely does. And we could, we could crimp that like that picture there could have been crimped, but um, a lot of our planting goes on in April. And by then we're, we're just not to a point with our cover crops where crimping is real effective to terminate. Okay. It looks like more of a comment here, but the extended season needed to establish crops at a lower seeding rate could also be viewed as a climate adaptation strategy for longer growing seasons. Let's move on to the next question. How have um, your farmer neighbors reacted to your practices? Are they interested or do they try to ignore what you're doing? Uh, you know, we get a lot of interest. We've actually started a group um, called the Arkansas Soil Health Alliance, where we are trying to, you know, help help farmers that are wanting to get started not make the same mistakes that we all made, or, you know, the few of us that were early adopters, because we had to learn by trial and error. We just didn't have anybody to lean on. Um, so that's, we've kind of set up a group like that. But yeah, you know, you've got neighbors that just aren't ever going to change. And, you know, they just think I'm crazy, but that's all right. They can think what they want. 
doesn't bother me. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit more in detail about your irrigation savings and what you observed in both dry spells and flood events? Sure. So uh, we're all furrow irrigated. So uh, for those of y'all that aren't familiar with that, we don't have pivots or anything like that. We, we bed things up here in the south and um, we run water down furrows. Um, that's just how we do it. It's uh, We get quite a bit of rain. Um, well, we actually get about 60 inches a year and still have to irrigate, which is sad, but that's just the way it is. <clears throat> but for example, like on corn, you know, typically um, in Arkansas, most everybody will probably water corn on a five to seven day schedule. So they'll, you know, start on Monday, finish Friday, and then start the next Monday or something like that, regardless of what's happening, because they don't hold any water in their soil you know they'll infiltrate a couple inches the rest will run off corn sucks it up and then it's rolled up again by the end of the week so what we've been able to do is stretch that interval from you know five to seven to ten to fourteen really easily uh, and we've actually gone as far as 21 if the temperatures and stuff made it, you know let us now when it gets really hot and just pure sunshine and high humidity uh, you know that 10 to 14 is going to catch it about every time but but we have been able to stretch that to 21. So, you know, you're talking about a 50 to 65% reduction in water, water use, uh, which, you know, right now water's abundant here in Arkansas, but it's not always going to be. And, uh, you know, there's no reason to use it if you don't need to. Oh yeah. Impressive change. Um, let's see. When you submit a soil sample to the lab or university, do you tell them the depth of the samples and do you think they're more or less accurate when you sample at depth? I, you know, they, they want a zero to six sample. So like my samples at depth, I just send them all in like they're zero to six samples. Um, I, I send them six inches of soil, so it shouldn't matter, you know, where they came from in the soil profile. Um, you know, the, all their calibrations are based off that six inches because that's a, a, a measurement of volume you know so um no i don't tell them it came from two foot down i just send it in as a six inch sample that i've code myself so i can put it back in my spreadsheet when i get it back and uh because i don't want them doing anything different i want them to treat them all the same so i can see what they're telling me and and when they tell me i need to apply 200 pounds of potassium but i've got you know six at depth samples that say I've got 200 pounds per acre each. My question to them is why, you know? Yeah, fair question. Um, okay. Uh, another cover crop question. What are the species in your cover crop mix that you roll down? Uh, and do they have to be at a certain stage to get a good kill? Yeah. So that, that one in that video was uh cereal rye, uh, hairy vetch and, uh, uh, winter peas. I was planting, or that was going ahead of corn. Um, yeah, they have to be at a certain stage to get a good kill from crimping. Um, and, you know, that plant, that there was late planted corn. So that's why they were big enough. I could have cr crimped and killed those. But uh, generally when we plant corn, they're about half that size. And they haven't reached a susceptible stage in their development for crimping. Uh, and with our harvest capacity and things like that, I have to, I can't just wait and plant. I've got to stage it where I can get it harvested in a timely fashion. That's one of my hangups. It's not so much about, you know, I'm trying to plant early on corn just because that's what I do. It's just, I've got to get corn in and get it out before rice and beans and things like that. So, uh, I don't generally get to plant corn that late now, soybeans, I get to plant, you know, later and I, I could do a lot of crimping on soybeans, but I'm just not set up to. So. I just use light rates of glyphosate and things like that. I try to use as little as possible uh, to get the job done. So you'll pretty soon after you'll follow that with a no-till drill or something like that. Yeah. So we had a planter coming right behind that, uh, that roller. We were probably 30 minutes behind him uh, planting corn into that. So, and I've got, you know, I've got some, if I'd had time today, I could have put some planter stuff in there, but uh, you know, we've got, lot of information to get through today yeah okay um let's see um here's a 
Thank you for your pioneering for pioneering this system. You make it sound easy and simple, but I'm sure it took a lot of research mm. and experimentation on your part. How do you feel crop rotation plays into your control of diseases and pests? Yeah, no, it, it, this was, it's, it's still not easy. Um, and yeah, I don't want anybody to get the, get the impression that this is just a, you know, gravy train way to farm. It takes a lot of management and a lot of sticking and moving because, you know, this is a living system that you're dealing with. It's not something you can just put on the back burner and go to the lake for the weekend, you know, but the flip side of that is, you know, when everybody's out in the spring, really cranking and tilling and doing all that, we're, we're still kind of sitting idle and, you know, we've got some time to do some things there. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a different way to manage time, but, but you really got to think on your feet with this system. And I have had some very painful learning curves to go through. So that's another reason we started that group to try to help people avoid that. And then, uh, the second part of that question was what now? How do you feel your crop rotation plays into your control of diseases and pests? Right. So crop rotation, in my opinion, is huge. Um, you know, we've got four crops that we rotate, try to rotate on every acre uh, between, you know, soybeans, cotton, corn, and rice. You know, we've got two grasses and two broad leaves. And then obviously we mix uh, cover crops in there every winter. So we're trying to keep something different happening there as much as possible. And we do rotate some livestock in when we're able to, when it makes sense. But we try to mix it up as often and as much as possible. Uh, we don't ever double anything back to back. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying that's a bad thing to do. We just don't do it. Uh, you know, so, yeah, I think it has a huge role because, you know, so, uh, pest and disease cycles are they, – they get in a rhythm just like everything else. And if you keep that rhythm from establishing – you, you're you're ahead of the curve okay let's see what type of data can researchers provide to producers that help inform decisions around management for soil health how do you feel how do you feel as compares to measurements that are geared towards pub publications in academic journals oh that's a that's a tough question um so i was i'm a product of that system okay so I understand how all that works, but my problem with it is, uh, and, and where I don't see value is how narrowly focused most of the research is. This system can't be broken into parts individually. Um, it's not a, it's not a one plus one plus one equals three system. It's a one plus one plus one equals seven. Uh, everything is connected and it all reacts off of each other so it's very hard for academia to to tease out one little thing and see what that piece is doing to this system because you know it, it just doesn't work that way and and to try to force it into that box in my opinion produces a lot of worthless research um now evaluating a system as complex as this how, how do you do that and and apply statistics and see where the you know, value is, I don't know how you would do that. That would be a huge undertaking, but somebody needs to start looking at it because this, uh, take it apart piece by piece and try to see what each thing does, doesn't work because, you know, one thing may react different if you have two other pieces versus three other pieces and you just can't, you just can't take it apart like that. And I, that's, that's the flaw I see currently with our, uh, academia research yeah um let's see so maybe maybe you can add to the first part of this question um what type of data can producers uh, provide that might help inform decisions around management for soil health well you know some of the things that i want to see and we're working on here is um you know how my uh, soil life is evolving based on my rotations, my, you know, input use, cover crop blends. I want to see, you know, how, if I, you know, if I use a, a heavy grass mix per se, how does that affect microbial associations in the soil? Is it, is it hurting or increasing or, or do I have more protozoa, you know, feeding on things and, and cycling nutrients that way? If I have a heavy you know, brassica mix or, 
or if I put soybeans and corn together, and then follow it with cotton, what's the effect on the soil life? And, and then how does that affect the cotton crop? I mean, it's, it's real complex problems, but you know, that's the kind of stuff that we need to be looking at. Um, but I don't know if we'll ever be able to come up with a, a formula, you know, like if you want to plant cotton in year three, then you need to do this, 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 and this in years one and two. I don't know if you'll ever be able to come up with that because there's so many different environmental factors and things that happen year over year. I, I just don't know, but, um, uh, I think, I just think that even the thought that we're ever going to really completely understand what's happening underneath our feet is, um, uh, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around. Yeah, complex systems. They're hard to hard to study for sure. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Well, suggesting people who favor conventional ag. Sorry. Well, suggesting people who favor conventional ag are brought out to advance the adoption of the good practices you have adopted. I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Let's see. Mm, let me move on to another one. Unless that the you'd like to restate the question. Let's see. Let me see if there's another question in the meantime that I can get to. Let's see. Or I'll just ask the question on my own um, while we wait for, for more. Um, so you described uh, seeding, fertility, and pest management as your primary savings vehicles for saving money um but i wonder if you could expand on some of your initial your primary initial investments and costs and how you factored those into your financial plan sure so that's a big question i always get what kind of equipment am i gonna have to buy what am i gonna have to do to get into this and uh i didn't buy anything you know so when i started this thing rex mentioned it in the intro we were broke uh we were literally going broke trying to fight pigweeds so I didn't have money to invest in anything. Um, you know, the first year I did it, I was only able to afford 300 acres of cover crop seed. Uh, so I had to make my planters work. I had to make my, you know, furrow equipment work. And the way we did that was just, uh, you know, making slight modifications to what we had. So, you know, like our planters, you know, we used to run big row cleaners and, you know, all this stuff. We took all that stuff off after a bunch of trial and error and just, the biggest thing was uh, really good, sharp disc openers, adequate down pressure, and a good closing wheel system. Well, any planter worth its salt has those three things on it anyway. So you're not buying additional equipment or big fancy planters. Uh, you can make what you have work. And that's what we did because we didn't have the money to buy anything else. So uh, my advice to you, if you're a farmer getting into this, is don't let an equipment dealer tell you you need the highest price newest planner to do this because that's bunk uh it's not true uh you know you can make what you have work uh, we planted vegetables one year and i think rex has seen this talk because he commented on it one time but i had a little monosome planter and again i what i tell you we need disc openers downforce and a good closing wheel system well it had good disc openers and it had a good closing wheel system but no downforce so instead of putting an $1,100 a row downforce system on, we put an old insecticide box on and filled it up with quickcrete. And we had plenty of adequate downforce. Planter worked perfect. We spent, you know, $60 a row instead of 1100 So just, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of money to do this. You just got to think. And Omar, I think we'll have to cut it off right there. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Thanks, and, Adam. Uh, Yep. Yeah, thank Adam, you. thank you very much. It's uh, common sense and maybe not so common sense, uh, <laughs> what you just provided, um, but definitely inspiring. And it, <clears throat> it gives me optimism for the future. Um, just hope you can keep on spreading the word. And I really appreciate what you said. And next on the docket is Harry Green, and uh, he's going to be talking about agroforestry, which I think is a, an underutilized um, concept uh, in in thinking and practice in, in this country. So Harry, go ahead. Thank you, Rex and Adam. Thanks for the 
great presentation. I haven't yet been down to Arkansas, but hopefully soon. Been checking off a number of states lately, so hopefully that one's up next. I'm just gonna share my screen quickly. Desktop, there we go. All right. We good to go? Everyone see this? You might put it in presentation mode. Awesome. All right. So welcome to this talk on this fine Tuesday. Um, Going to be diving into agroforestry and a bit about water quality and flooding. So a little bit of twist on what we usually talk about. Here's an agenda, just so you can, you can keep track of everything. We'll work through what agroforestry is. Then secondly, we'll look into what's called an overyield or a land equivalency ratio. So why is agroforestry the combination of trees and crops generally more productive than growing them in separation? Third, we'll look at some working agroforestry farms in the US and abroad. And then we'll talk about agroforestry and flooding and then we'll look into designing a farm in real time with our software. So, and then we'll save it, save some time for questions at the end. Just a little bit about Propagate Ventures. We're a team of 13 folks now. We started in 2017. We're currently advising on 75 farms, uh, mostly in the Eastern continental United States, a few farms in Hawaii. Uh, about other than that, about as far west as Minneapolis and Austin, and then as far south as, say, Austin to Georgia, and then up to the Canadian border. Uh, and we work with agroforestry analytics, so financials, economics, which set land managers up for financing, deployment, plant generally, tree planting. Happy to jam more on that later on. All right, so we've, we've probably seen uh, a whole lot of photos like this when we think about farming in the context of land management, climate change, um, not, a, not a knock on these farmers, but this is what the, uh, this, this is a photo of what used to be the Amazon. So we in agroforestry see that becoming something maybe a little bit more like this. Uh, so this is just a grain crop and then this is wheat and poplar in Southern France. And this is really just a it's a photo, it's at a research plot in, in uh, Montpellier, which it just illustrates kind of what agroforestry can be. Uh, it's not that poplar and wheat is gonna be profitable for everyone, uh, but it, this, this photo in particular really just um, gives a good visual. And on the whole, uh, trees and crops combined are about 40% more productive than either of those two in isolation. And I'll get into, I'll get into why that is in a second. And with returns in ag at or below 5%, uh, there are a lot of folks that come to us looking for alternatives um, when they wanna add perennials to their lands, like apples, fruit in general, uh, nuts, and then timber systems, different, different crops for different contexts. But there are really economic, financial, and business challenges in the way of making this happen. So we, as a business really look towards de-risking agroforestry, increasing certainty on costs, revenues, yields, labor assumptions, general economic returns. This is our team. Uh, this is from a few months ago. We've since added a few folks to that, to there, uh, but three co-founders and then a whole bunch of employees. And so I'll, I'll run through the software platform after this, uh, this presentation, the slide deck, but we, we essentially use a, um, it's a, it's a software platform. You draw a line and get income statements for trees. And that's really with the goal of deer and tree, tree crops, connecting land managers with financing and scaling agroforestry. So this concept of overyield, uh, you see that 40% statistic that's from the photo that you can see in the background of poplars and wheat. Uh, it's a 4% discount rate for the timber um, for all you finance folks. And all right, just an explanation of overyield. If we're looking at either plantation forestry 
or grain-based ag, kind of just one crop on each landscape. Both of those canopies are two-dimensional. And just so for some, some sample math here, this is purely for um, conversational purposes. Left, you get 100 acres of 100 units of wood from a plantation, or you get 100 acres of grain on the right, you have 200 units total from two acres. With the combination, you get less wood and less understory crop per acre. So say 70 units of wood, 70 units of wheat, it's 140 units per acre total. But then for two acres, you get 280 units total. So 200 versus 280, so 140% increase. That's uh, just an example, but some real world examples. This is polonia and wheat in China. And China's kind of a, it's a wood scarce country on the whole. So growing polonia makes sense, even though it would be a generally um, say entry level timber crop here. This is probably the latitude of South Carolina um, with a little bit of shade. They were able to achieve 99 to 104% wheat yield with, um, with even with a little bit of shade. Another example, silvo pasture. It's a, it's a super common practice in agroforestry, especially as you get, say, south of Virginia or so. Some stats there on hot days, cattle with access to tree shade either gain 60% more weight or produce 20% more milk. Uh, this is a fully industrialized practice. There are, say, 200,000 acres of it in the north of Argentina. And when you widen the spacing on those trees, instead of a plantation, just a tightly spaced, say, red pine plantation like that, no grass underneath, you get fatter trees. So you get saw logs instead of pulp. And uh, Adam, just a, a correlation or a, a point of, what is it, analogous to what you're talking about with spacing on cotton, you get bigger plants, same thing with trees. Um, so with overyield, we can talk about productivity for a while, but what we're really looking at is overyield of income uh, with dollars being what folks who are looking to make a profit from land use. So back in the day, it might have been overyield of calories, or if you're a subsistence farmer, it might be just the same thing, inputs being labor, outputs being calories. But in, um, in the US, we like to focus on income. And to value tree crops, it's, it's hard to use simple ROI because that's just ending cash minus beginning cash over, over the, the time period. So we have to look at the net present value and the internal rate of return. The net present value is, I'll actually, I'll, I'll do this slide and then I'll explain those two metrics. Um, because tree crops, you have this lag time until yield happens. You don't, you don't break even for a number of years. You have to look at the time value of money. So what is $100 worth to me today versus if someone gave me $100 in 10 years? And you're going to want the money today because you can use it for things. You can invest it. Um, you can provide value to yourself. And the question that arises here is how do we express uh, the 2020 or 2022 uh, today's dollars? Um, that how do we express all future cash flows in today's dollars? And that, that's a really good way of comparing systems over a 10 year time period, um, just because you have to look at uh, income from 2040 in the, in the same way or in the same, um, uh, same value as you're using to uh, look at dollars today. So net present, that's net present value, uh, all future income, income raised in today's dollars. And then the internal rate of return answers the question, if we got a loan from a bank, say for a mortgage or an operating loan, um, at this interest rate, the bank would eat all of our profits. So you have a 20% IRR, that means basically if you got a a loan at 20% to finance your operations, you wouldn't make any money at the end of the year because the bank would eat all your profits. So 20% is a high interest rate. So the higher the IRR, the better. All right. So this basically valuing tree systems with the time value of money allows us to look at our return on investment, our return on our time, and our return on capital. So 
um, just gonna take a pause here, a little bit of a breather. Um, if anyone has, say, questions, maybe you can throw them in the chat or write them down. Um, we are gonna come back to questions at the end, but if there's anything burning, um, happy to, to answer that now. And please put your questions in the Q&A and Hoover, not the chat. I guess so. Uh, Omar, Rex, feel free to air. Do we, uh, Omar, do we get anything? Yeah, it looks like we got a question about suggestions for agroforestry perennial species in the south. Cool. Well, yeah, let's. Um, ooh, interesting. In this, in the south of the U.S. Yes. Oh man. Um, I have to f know what. The, what's going on in the land if it's like a production farm or a grazing operation um but for and in, in how far south uh, it looks so like it's central texas hardiness central zone texas. eight uh is it if it is it east of 98 degrees i.e has it started raining again is it east of the rain line i think either way um if you're far south enough i think ooh you're really far south lucina could be interesting otherwise like if it's a livestock system mulberry or willow could be really cool um as browse for the livestock so cows eating trees um that's that's also in the pecan area so if, if nut production is interesting or if your soil is acidic enough chestnuts could be really cool great yeah maybe the questioner can use that to add a follow-up question um we also have a question from about uh, what are some examples of large scale agroforestry in the US or Canada? Yeah, so in Canada, it's a difficult one. It's not too difficult. There are a lot of shelter belts and windbreaks in the US and in Canada. Uh, after the Dust Bowl, we put in a whole lot of windbreaks. And the, the thing is there, there aren't say uh, a few hundred thousand acres of plantation plantation silvo pasture, but I think that's a really good direction in general uh, for us to go. There are a lot of folks that graze underneath pecans in Georgia and Texas and whatnot. Um, yeah, we can, we can, but let me think on that a little bit. So is there a whole lot of, the agroforestry in the U.S. is kind of a, it's, it's scaling up right now, but it's also really nascent in that practitioners are generally smaller farms. So you're not going to have um, 400,000 acres of silva pasture, even though you have uh, 400,000 acres of, of pecans in general. All right. Um, any other questions? Um, I'll save this one for the end. Um, cool. If you don't, yeah. There's Sounds just one good. more, but yeah, you can feel free to continue. Awesome. Um, so just on econ. We can talk about how, yes, you can have multiple stories in a system and highlighting that, say, wheat can grow under poplar trees is less relevant than both wheat and poplar being both profitable to grow at the same time. So there are lots of different combinations and which one makes sense really depends on a farm's context. Uh, all right, so working agroforestry farms, hopefully this will answer a few questions. This is in Patagonia. It's poplar silvo pasture. Uh, it's about 1400 acres in, let's say Northern Patagonia. They do, it's a big beef operation and then they do wood and olive oil as well. Uh, this is user farms. It's in Eastern Kentucky. It's mostly chestnuts, but when they have the cattle in there, it's silvo pasture. Finger Lake Cider House. I'm gonna focus on the Finger Lakes just because that's where I live. I'm about 10 minutes from here. This is an organic orchard with asparagus in between. They also do peaches. And they do Thanksgiving turkeys. So when you have poultry in an orchard system, technically it becomes silvo pasture. So yeah, you can have sheep in there as well. Also near me, Angus Glen Farm. It's in Watkins Glen, New York. It's one lake over to the west. Uh, they have a whole bunch of different types of silvo pasture, living barns, uh, walnut, different conifers, but locust is really what they focus on just because the returns on that tree uh, and the price per board foot and the growth rate, growth rate all provide a uh, generally good outlook. Uh, Brett Chedzo is a Cornell Cooperative Extension Forester. 
uh, puts out a whole lot of resources on silver pasture. Also does a lot of thinning of existing forest. So thin a few trees, put the cattle in, grass comes up, uh, and then you have either shade paddocks or um, shelter paddocks in the winter or just um, another acre with, with two functions. It's another photo. All right. Um, I know I, do, I want to also focus on kind of action items for folks that are in policy. So not, not, not just farm, not just farm oriented folks, uh, but we'll say systems folks. Uh, so uh, agroforestry, if it's generally profitable and we're familiar with a few ecosystem services that it provides, uh, how should we think about trees in the context of water uh, and ecosystem services? So here's a, this photo is actually from Turkey. The runoff from the left is from tilled cropland and the runoff on the right is from the forest. And if we're going for good water quality, we wanna to stray towards what's on the right. All right, and this is just a chart I put together. This is not empirical data. These are just kind of ratings that I was thinking about a few days ago. Uh, first ecosystem service of trees is say flood control. You get more infiltration into the ground, um, higher perme permeability, uh, higher canopy roughness. So if, you, if you're in a rainstorm and you stand beneath an evergreen tree, you're gonna get uh, less drenched. And the, the same is tr true for flood waters and runoff. So the thing with flood controls is that they, excuse me, with floods is that they wash your house away uh, and they're hard to ignore. Uh, the immediacy of the damage is pretty significant. Uh, number two, nutrient uptake. So we probably heard about the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico and in other places. Uh, so basically nitrogen, phosphorus, runoff, create algae blooms, eutrophication, kills the fish. Um, it's, it's easier to ignore than floods. Uh, and the kind of the immediacy of the damage is also a little bit um, We'll say it's a little bit less. A good example of this, riparian buffers. So bringing the system above, that's a before picture to below to the after picture. Uh, adding trees to stream sides actually captures three times as much nitrogen and four to nine, nine times as much phosphorus as grass alone. And this is just in the buffer. We also have to think about uh, in the field itself. So whether that's um, Increasing permeability of soils, cover crops, all awesome options for water quality, but this photo is just to, to focus on trees. All right, so if we add biodiversity as an ecosystem service from trees, just adding more species to a landscape. My favorite statistic here is that, I forget where this was, but a 4% increase in bats led to a 10% decrease in malaria deaths. So increasing complexity, um, it's super interesting and it's good for us as well. Last one, uh, carbon in the context of soils and trees. Um, folks really like to focus on that because it's, it's I'd say it's easier to measure uh, than, I mean, depends how you look at it, but it's it's something that can be measured and it's, it's at the forefront of a whole lot of discussions because of emissions uh, from transportation ag, um, et cetera. So it might be um, easier to ignore because of the long-term detriments of say uh, an unstable climate, but then the immediacy of the damage is, um, is much less than flooding. So today, I think it makes more sense to focus on flooding uh, given that this is, we're, we're, that we're um, having a, a bit more of a discussion about water. So into flood control. Um, just a few figures here. Hurricane Irene in 2011 in Vermont caused $750 million in damages. Uh, about 80 years before, uh, $4 billion in damages adjusted for inflation. And then Hurricane Harvey, not just from the floods, but in Houston, that was about $125 billion. So floods are cl uh, pretty clear and present. Uh, if we look at photos on the left and photos on the right, um, just take a pause and think about what's going on here. On the, on the left, you have something that's impermeable and on the right, it's highly permeable and captures a whole lot of water. And uh, this, the, the figure here is that one acre of parking lot 
has the same amount of runoff as 36 acres of forest. So if we're thinking about controlling floodwaters, uh, we'll say permeable landscapes in the uplands are gonna do a whole lot there. Uh, figures in blue, this is not empirical data. I just threw some stuff up there. Um, if basically if you're increasing canopy complexity, the more you move towards a forest, the more water you're going to observe, uh, absorb. And say cover crops could be alley cropping with cover crops. That could be a combination. Um, pasture is a huge spectrum from compacted pasture to holistic plant grazing. Orchards also change um, with silvo pasture and multi-strata agroforestry. Basically, the closer you get to a forest with really diverse um, above ground and below ground biomass, then the more flood water you're going to absorb. All right, um, just some econ, maybe it's jargon, maybe it's not for you, but for the economists and the policy folks, if we think about eco ecosystem services as public goods, um, a stable climate and carbon absorption, it's a public good with global bounds. So it's a really difficult market failure to look at. Uh, flood control has regional bounds, watersheds, so it's easier to find solutions too. So this is, um, it's, we'll ca call it my opinion or um, what really was top of mind for today, but flooding I think deserves our focus because it's localized and it's really apparent. All right, so we're looking at, so formerly we we're looking at uh, returns to farms, avoided damages, costs, minus costs, net benefit to society. Um, we also have to ask the question, not, not we also, but consequently we have to ask the question, how much does agroforestry cost to implement and manage? Because if we have a budget for it, whether it's publicly funded or if we have a cost model for it, if we're looking at private investment, then uh, knowing our costs is really how to make this work. So I'm gonna exit the presentation now and go over to over yield. Um, and this is the platform that we use to model agroforestry. And what happens is we can draw a line and get financials. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of back end that goes on here. Uh, so it's not that simple, but um, I'll walk through it slowly. Yeah, I think the contour map's gonna load here. Actually just hide it. There we go. All right. So if we're going to design a farm, we're gonna add in things like headlands, the space between the edge of field and the trees, hide those uh, to delineate where those watershed boundaries are. I like to add in ridges and valleys, so I'll hide those. Uh, all, that, all that green, those are roads. That's an access, so I can hide that. Uh, fences, that's a deer fence over there. I can hide that. I can hide the farm boundary. And with that, we're left with trees. There's also a pond there. And basically, we'll go to economics for all this. Take a second to load. It gives us different return rates for different crops. That's for the whole system. I can filter for Chinese chestnut. Everything changes. Go back to all crops. Go to the yield. It's going to be in either pounds or board feet or whatever the product is. Go to revenue. So in different years, what can we expect in terms of revenue? Uh, we can switch this from a graph to an income statement as well. Operations, uh, in terms of cost, what does it cost to install, manage, harvest, and market trees and their associated crops? Uh, and you can have this graph on a year by, or excuse me, 30 year basis, or I can go to 2024 look into management and know how much it's going to cost to, to do anything that I'm uh, going to need to do. Labor, it's, it's really the same deal, but click back to 15 years. We have to ask how many labor hours per year is this farm going to take to manage? So how many full-time equivalents, when in the season are we going to have to manage a tree crop? Really important question. Inputs, uh, same deal here. So it depends on the year, but if I go to 2024, um, tree tubes, electricity, seed, 
uh, Irish Spring, it's a deer deterrent. Uh, sea Shield, that's a organic fertilizer, excuse me, spray. Um, same with MicroPack, um, effective microbes, all that. Capital, this is our infrastructure. So what are we gonna need to buy to make the farm work? Uh, and the depreciation and use of that is all worked into the operational expenditures. Lastly, carbon, let's see if we can move this. The box is hiding. All right, that's 15 year, but basically get a graph of uh, tons per total tons and then tons per acre and then tons per tree. Um, I'm going to show a few more design tools here and then we can exit for questions. I want to draw a new section. Basically what I do is draw a box, a bit of a lag. Come on, hit enter. And this, uh, the zoom, all right, there we go. Zoom panel was obvious getting the right hand panel in here. Contour maps coming up, I'll hide that. Click here, I'm gonna change this to call it chestnuts between the rows. I can change it to 40 foot spacing if I want, uh, and then rotate this to be either north, south, or in, in alignment with the, with the contour, whatever's interesting. Hit done, and then the economics are automatically gonna change. I'll delete this for now. Actually, I'll, I'll keep it, um, draw another one. New section, line, go over to here if I wanna draw a windbreak or something like that. And then row count four, go over, call it biodiversity, new field over here. And then the last tool, which will be interesting for the folks that are familiar with agroforestry, key line and whatnot. We'll draw a box like we're going to do a grid and then draw a guideline through it such that if we're doing contour farming or just farming and that's roughly parallel or excuse me on contour but also parallel then we can have lines that turn where we want them to and that, that allows us to um we'll say reduce reduce erosion or just kind of have a road on a ridge where it's drier, enables better access. Um, and yeah, we'll say avoid driving in valleys. And that is, um, that's about it for what I had planned. Uh, happy to jump into questions. I think um, one, one more thing, if you wanna look, look this up, um, it's overyield.com and then and kind of fill out um, kind of how, how it would make sense to work with your farm and that'll um, that'll be a contact form for us. So overyield.com and then propagateventures.com. Hey, Harry, thank you very much for that presentation. Very interesting and uh, a lot of food for thought there. Omar, I leave it up to you to kind of monitor the questions. Okay, great. It looks like we have about 15 minutes. So I guess we'll get through as many of these as we can. And if we have some time left over, we'll ask some of those pending questions for Adam. Um, so let's get started. Can you discuss the differences between wood versus fruit and nut systems in terms of profitability and in terms of the strip crops used below? What crops yep. are most profitable? Yeah, so if you... If you want to be a fruit grower, that's kind of a high risk, high reward system where you're going to have higher annual income per acre, but the amount of management hours is maybe 25 times that of timber. So if you want to plant it and forget about it, not totally forget about it because you have to prune it, um, timber is a great option. If you want to turn and burn, fruit is for you. Um, what you grow in the understory, uh, probably to do cool season grasses if it's a livestock operation. Uh, they, so warm season works too. You have, you have to figure out how much dry matter you need 
based on how many pounds of animal you have going through a certain amount of acres, but grazers know how to deal with that. Um, for the understory on fruit trees, it's kind of whatever you're interested in. Um, if you have a market for, I don't know, garlic or asparagus on a small scale, then that works. Um, did I answer that whole question? I believe so. Let me let me just look real quick because I moved it down to where it go. Oh, one more thing. Right. Um, C3 grasses do a lot better with shade, with partial shade, so wheat, etc., than C4 grasses do. So corn under trees doesn't work that well. Okay. Um, yeah, it looks like you got to the to to the both parts of the question. Let's see. Can planting tree seeds rather than buying trees while starting uh, with alley crops, uh, as Mark Shepard did, can that um, offset the economic costs in the first year or two? Uh, not really. Um, it's, I mean, in the tropics, yes, uh, because you plant a seed and it grows into a tree in year one, um, which is kind of amazing to me. If you, so the, the strategy of an oak tree in a, in a cold climate is to produce say 4,000 acorns and hope that two germinate. Um, so I would, I mean, you, you, could, you could direct seed and just thin. Um, no one does that though, unless they don't value their time. Okay, let's see. What's a good mulberry variety in a pasture? This person is located 30 miles east of San Antonio, zone eight. San Antonio, okay. Um, it's hard to find different varieties. I think just getting conservation grade Morris rubra would be the best option now. There are, there's a, where is it? Um, I have a book. If you can find it, it's called Moor Culture. And if you really want to geek out on mulberries, this was written for silkworm production before silk moved out of Japan. It's translated from Japanese. Um, that's going to give you cultivars and management. I've read part of it. So if you really want to geek out on mulberries, that's there. Great. Let's see. Processing facilities and marketing must play a big role in crop selection for both the annual and perennial components of an agroforestry system. Can you talk a little bit about how you analyze the market and processing to design a system? Totally, yeah. So the more, so it, it, I'm gonna answer with a few different components here. First is what you wanna be doing with your time. Do you wanna be dealing with people? Do you wanna be direct marketing? How much margin do you wanna capture? And then what do you wanna be doing are kind of two opposing forces. So if you want to direct market chestnuts, you're going to be spending time on the internet and mailing boxes of chestnuts. If you don't want to do that, then you should grow a crop that has a price floor. And by that, I mean, you can take it somewhere, sell everything and call it a day. You can't really do that with things like black currants that are say niche to growth market crops because it, it, there's no Ribena in the US, which is a, it's a British drink made of black currants like Fanta but made with black currants. Um, so yeah, you're gonna be stuck with a whole lot of product if there's no price floor. So you have to look at what do you wanna be doing? How much margin do you wanna make? Um, and how much time is it gonna take you to sell everything? Usually marketing is the, except for like Aronia because no one really wants to buy it. Um, if it's, it's the lowest, time commitment out of the whole like number of hours from installation management harvest and marketing is that it's the lowest percentage of time so even if you have to um uh grid and bear it it's um it's generally the high, it's a high value add activity okay let's see what cost share programs under nrcs might help fund agroforestry systems uh, EQIP, so it's the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Uh, search terms are EQIP payment schedules. You're going to want to look those up for your state and then start talking to your local agent um, frequently, like three years before you want to actually do anything. Um, 
those folks, uh, we've heard them say, make a mess and we'll clean it up. So what they do is address a resource concern. So if you have erosion, um, manure issues, et cetera, then, they're, then they'll be more likely to fund you because the program's put in place in order to counteract uh, ecologically difficult things before adding trees to a farm that's already ecologically innovative. That totally depends on who you're working with. So some, um, we'll say regions will be really gung-ho to plant trees and fund, fund that, uh, whether it's buffers or hedgerow, they call them hedgerows, um, et cetera. So totally regionally dependent. Um, if you wanna take that on, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hopefully worth it. Right, yeah, that was nice and concise. Oh, and you can write $10,000 of reforestation expenses off of your personal tax return every year. If you own the land or lease the land. Are there certain management strategies that you can employ to reduce competition between your trees and your crops in an agroforestry system in order to maximize the yield of both species? Yeah, yeah. So below ground competition for water and nutrients is much less significant than the competition for light above ground. So it's really a question of what are the trees going to intercept versus what arrives in terms of photosynthetic energy at the crop. Um, if you're super focused on understory crops, then planting shorter trees, um, whether that's, I don't know, biomass willow, if that works for you, or uh, something that is a shrub that has mechanized harvest. I don't know of anyone that's doing mechanized black currants with like grain in between, but that would be, that would be reasonable um, or mechanized hazelnuts in a hedge when those really come online that's going to be amazing for alley cropping let's see how might agroforestry systems save on water use and irrigation if you have more shade you have less evaporation um it's a good question a lot of times you'll have to irrigate the trees as well. Um, they add a lot of organic matter from the leaves that fall down. Um, another one is wind protection. So you have less evaporation. Um, that's for both plants on the leeward side of a windbreak or, uh, and the windward side to a little, to a small extent and for livestock as well. It's basically if, if you're, if you can have access to a windbreak and it's 90 degrees and there's a 40 mile per hour wind, then that's a, it's a good place to be if you're a cow or a person. Hmm. Have you seen an increase in shelter belts being established recently and specifically where in the US? I, so the National Center for Agroforestry, um, I might've gotten that acronym wrong, I apologize, would have more data on that. Um, I personally, I'm not sure. Or National Agroforestry Center, I think. Drawing a blank. I we know them, but forget the acronym. Okay. What are some things to keep in mind when deciding which tree or crop combinations would be the most profitable for a growing context? Yeah. Um, if it's not profitable if you don't manage it. So you really have to plant something that you want to deal with. Um, as an example, I'm full-time agronomist. I'm going to probably keep doing that for a few decades or whatever full-time job I have. I also have a farm. It's 50 acres. I'm doing chestnuts and black locust um, because I say I could go do like ornamental willow or something super niche like that or start a fruit farm, but I simply don't have the hours in the week to go do that unless I want to go and manage another team of on-farm employees, which I like to say I can do at any one time, I can do two things in my life really well. When I start doing three or four, the quality goes down. So in, in terms of picking a crop, you have to ask what you want out of your life and how you want to manage it. 
And have you found any particular combinations that maybe tend to be more profitable than others? Our go to, uh, our go to's are like chestnuts, locust, um, fodder crops and windbreaks if you have livestock and it's windy um, or hot for silvo pasture. Um, if you want to sell purple berries, uh, currants, elderberries, saskatoons are super interesting. Uh, if you can mechanically harvest all of that, the more of that you have, the better. Um, if you are already growing apples, maybe cider apples look super interesting, depending on where you are. Um, I want to say, I, I don't know if this is profitable, not, but profitable or not, but I would love to see someone plant like super wide spacing of either semi-standard or standard rootstock cider varieties let them be biennial, spray them not a lot and like tree shake cider apples. I think that would be super interesting. I modeled that, but no one's doing it and the returns look pretty good. So I guess it depends. It depends on market Yeah, it dep reality. depends what you want to do with your life. Um, yeah, that. yeah I, I like spending time in the woods with a chainsaw. Um, I like forests. Um, as far as I know, Adam likes grain and I eat grain and Adam uses wood as far as that, to build houses or wh whatever. So there are a lot of folks in society and at different people, there are different strokes for different folks, as they say. That's right, okay. Um, so uh, let's see, on an existing orchard, how would you turn that into an agroforestry system? Um, it depends, so, is it like a central valley orchard? If so, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's tongue in cheek, but um, <laughs> we'll go with like a New York conventional orchard. Um, if you want to manage poultry, you could do some of that in the understory. Um, you could forestry mulch every other row of trees and then do something else in between. So a forestry mulcher is like a wood chipper on the front of a bulldozer. And you or a, a loader or what, sometimes a skid steer just drive into the tree and it turns it into chips and sometimes tills the soil behind it so if you want if you had like a row to row orchard you could delete some rows um and then throw, throw something else in there if you wanted to do that if you liked apples less omar i'm gonna step in here i, I think we're about uh at the time limit here and i just wanted to thank Harry and Adam for really uh, compelling presentations and uh, convey my appreciation, uh, getting the word out about agroforestry and some of the tools available. And just the idea of agroforestry is great. And, and Adam, I always enjoy listening to you um, in your Southern drawl. <laughs> Uh, talk about the economics of soil health. It's just really compelling and uh, I really appreciate that. And um, enjoy the rest of the conference. And uh, thanks again, Adam and Harry. I really appreciate your, your present, presentations.